I know not why God's wondrous grace to me hath made known, nor why in worthy Christ to love redeem me for his own. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against the day. I know not how the saving faith to me he did impart, nor how believing in his word wrought peace within my heart. But I know my I believe it, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against the day. I know not how the spirit moves convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus through the word creating faith in me. But I know I have believed and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against the day. Okay, thank you so much. We won't do the whole hymn. I want to stop there. Uh, sorry for my... <laughs> And for my rusty voice, it's been a long time since I sang in a choir. Forget about the tune, uh, like they say, listen to the words and not the tune. Uh, but I just thought it would be good to start with that hymn today uh, because it uh, relates very closely with what uh, uh, we've been learning uh, for the last uh, couple of weeks. Actually, someone sent me uh, this hymn uh, after they watched uh, uh, the midweek devotions and uh, the third verse actually ministers to us directly. This is a this is a hymn I know whom I have believed, um, and uh, you you can get it uh, on this uh, uh, praises to the Most High. Uh, you can get it on uh, uh, hymn number eighty. Uh, the third verse says, "I know not how the Spirit moves, convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus through the Word, creating faith in Him." Uh, this is. Uh, the, author, the author of this hymn is just acknowledging that, I mean, we do not know how the Spirit works. And we talked about that a lot when we talked about uh, the work of the Spirit in the life of a believer. Uh, we do not know how the Spirit works, uh, but at least we know uh, he works under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, who we believe in, and that is all we need to know. And uh, I'm excited today as well, as we embark on today's lesson, uh, the work of the Spirit in sanctification. Uh, sanctification is basically talking about how, how the Spirit works within us to make us increasingly holy. Uh, uh, last week we talked about regeneration, which we said has to do with being born again. That is what regeneration means. Uh, being born again, uh, being made into a new creation. And so after regeneration, uh, the work of sanctification begins immediately. The work of the Spirit within us to make us holy. And I just want to very quickly um, just acknowledge uh, the book that I've been using uh, as I go through these uh, lessons. Um, maybe it's uh, the, the, the letters are inverted because of the camera, uh, but uh, this is uh, basically a summary. This is a book that gives us a summary of what uh, some great theologians uh, who lived in uh, two different generations, George Smithon and uh, John Orwell, uh, they did a lot of work uh, regarding the Holy Spirit. Uh, so 
this is uh, the book amongst many other resources that I've been using uh, just to help us have a systematic flow of the teaching of the Holy Spirit. And so as we get into this issue of sanctification, one thing that we need to acknowledge is that uh, when we are regenerate, uh, when the Spirit comes and regenerates us, the Spirit does not come into us and then leave us. The Spirit uh, makes our hearts his dwelling place. Uh, so he gets into us and he begins to work within us. And we see many scriptures in the Bible, uh, like John 14, uh, verse 16, uh, 2 Timothy 1, 14, uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 16. And all these passages talk about how the Spirit occupies the believer's heart and makes uh, the believer's heart his temple. And uh, when, the, when the Spirit dwells in us, uh, he saturates us, uh, he enlivens us, he empowers us uh, to do good works. And so when we talk about uh, the presence uh, of the Spirit in the life uh, mm -hmm. of, of, of a believer or in, in creation as well, when we talk about the presence of the Holy Spirit, we can talk about the presence of the Spirit in, in four different aspects, and I will, I will just uh, list them very quickly. Uh, one is to say that, uh, one is to acknowledge that uh, all living things are sustained by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is present in all creation. It is the Holy Spirit that con uh, conserves all things. The second aspect is the special sanctifying presence uh, in the life of a believer from the time that he is born again uh, to the time that he dies. And this is actually what we are going to be basing on today. This is what we, we, we are going to be uh, um, uh, focusing on uh, in regard to sanctification. And the third aspect is the Spirit's presence in the Son of God. And we talked about it uh, some two weeks ago. We talked about how uh, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, uh, is at work and was at work uh, in the life and times of the Son of God when he was here on earth and even after his glorification. And now that he's exalted and sits at the right hand of God the Father, he's still operating uh, through the Holy Spirit. And so the fourth thing, uh, the fourth aspect that we may want to consider in regard to the Spirit's presence is the Spirit's presence in glorified Christians who are now in heaven. It's an amazing, it's, 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 I mean, it's so comforting to know that uh, even after we depart from this body uh, that is uh, mortal, that we are still going to be at work. I mean, we are still going to be actively present in the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit will continue to work within us. And so, uh, basically, we are going to be focusing on the second uh, aspect, uh, which I mentioned about uh, very briefly, talking about sanctification. And it's, it's very important for us to make a very quick uh, distinction between uh, regeneration or the activity of the Spirit in regeneration and sanctification. And one of the things that we uh, mentioned uh, last week about regeneration is that we are not aware when regeneration is happening to us. When we are being made into new creatures, we are not aware. So um, in, in regeneration, there is no cooperation uh, between the Spirit, uh, between the Holy Spirit and the individual. While in sanctification, there is cooperation between the believer and the Spirit. We are required to you know, cooperate actively uh, with the Holy Spirit uh, so that uh, we can we actually we actually participate uh, in the process of making us actively holy. And uh, one of the things that we want to acknowledge also as far as uh, Christian morality is concerned is that we Christian morality is very different from the morality of other movements or other religions because we do not we never pursue our morals so that we may earn salvation because we are already saved by grace. Uh, I mean, look at any other religion apart from Christianity. You realize that now people are doing good works, people are engaging in, in, in righteous works, uh, people want to do good things uh, so that they can achieve a certain uh, salvation. They can get to the peak uh, of their faith. Uh, but in Christianity, we know that we are saved by grace. It's free of charge. We do not work for it. So Christian morality comes as a result of the power of the Spirit and not the other way around. And that's, a, that's an important aspect uh, to appreciate. So we, as a parish, uh, some months uh, ago, before the lockdown came, uh, we were doing a series of the fruit uh, of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 to 23. And uh, we were just appreciating 
that the Christian is able to achieve high levels of morality uh, not because of their own effort, but because of the Spirit, because of the work of the Spirit uh, that is at, at work within them. So the power of the Spirit is so great in the life of a Christian, and when we are in close fellowship with Christ, then we are able to, you know, um, have Christian virtues, have Christian morals uh, with very little effort. So the way we are able to be uh, moral as Christians, the way we are able to uh, engage in good behavior has nothing to do with our effort. Uh, the reason, I mean, Christian morality has nothing to do with any philosophy or idea. It simply has to do with the power of the Spirit within us. And we know that we have a great example in the Lord Jesus Christ, who, and the Bible continues to remind us that we need to imitate the life and character of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can never do any of these things apart from the Holy Spirit. And George Smithon, the one I just mentioned, clarifies one very important aspect, that there can be no perfection in the life of a Christian. As much as we are on the journey to being purified and being made increasingly holy, there can be no perfection in the life of a Christian. And we see uh, many people acknowledging that in the Bible. Uh, we, we are always ready to acknowledge as Christians. Actually, true Christians are always ready to acknowledge how far they are from the great goal. Uh, perfection is always the aim, but never the attainment uh, of the Christian life. So we really want to be perfect. We want to get there and attain perfection. That is our motivation. That is our goal. But we never get there. And one of the people that acknowledges how weak they are and how far they are from the goal is uh, Paul, Apostle Paul. And I just want to read one scripture here in uh, Philippians 3, uh, verse, uh, verse 13 and 14, where the Bible says, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it. This is Paul saying. He's acknowledging that I have not made it. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So Paul is saying, I am not yet there, and I know I'm not getting there soon, but I keep pressing on. And it's, it's, it's interesting that some people also assume that it is possible to do the will of God without some inward opposition within us. That, that you can get to a point where you are able to do ministry and you are able to serve God freely uh, without anything that restrains you uh, from within yourself. But when we look at the writings of Paul, uh, particularly in Romans 7, uh, 14 to 25, we see Paul sharing his struggles and he talks about how he's not able to do the right thing. There is, there is something that within, is within him and he calls it the law of sin. There is something that, uh, I mean, captures his mind and, him, and, and makes him feel like a prisoner of the law, a prisoner of the sin that works within him. And, and Paul is talking like this. Uh, as a Christian, he's not talking. Uh, he's not talking as somebody who has not been converted yet. He's a convert. He's a, he's an amazing guy. He's an apostle. He has preached uh, to many other many far countries, but he's acknowledging that man, I'm I'm, I'm such a wretched man. Who will save me from this body of death? Uh, this is uh, from Romans uh, chapter seven, uh, verse fourteen to twenty-five. And and if Apostle Paul can acknowledge that, then I mean, who are we to to claim? or to feel like we are heroes. So one of the things that we need to uh, be honest about as Christians is that there's always an inner resistance when we engage in any spiritual activity uh, because of the sin that is within us. So as we conclude our today's lesson, uh, maybe the conclusion would be to appreciate that the spirit is always at work within us. The degree to which sinners achieve holiness is imperfect and defective. As much as the Spirit of God is still within us, the Spirit of God is increasingly making us holy, but the farthest we can go while we are still here on earth is, in, is, I mean, is defective. Our holiness is still imperfect. So where does that leave the Christian? That we should always press on toward the goal, but also remember that we will never get to a point where there is no more inward conflict. And this is a good challenge to us so that we will never get to a point where we feel complacent, where we never get to a point where we feel, ah, I can make it, I'm okay, I'm holy. 
And it's unfortunate that some Christians will compare themselves with other people uh, that they know. Uh, maybe people who are struggling with uh, visible sins, uh, people who are struggling with addictions, and they will feel, oh God, I'm, I'm so holy, I'm okay. But the true Christian, the genuine Christian, before God knows that there is always an inner a restraint, an inner re resistance to do the good things. And he is called upon to mourn for his sin and ask God to fill him and guide him and give him victory. So thank you so much for listening to us. I just, uh, listening to me, I just want to say a prayer and pray that the Spirit of God will be upon you uh, in the journey of sanctification. And uh, shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for the time that you've given us here to learn uh, about uh, sanctification and how we pray that you would uh, continue to make us increasingly holy as we serve you. May we never tire to press on toward the mark. May we never be complacent as well. Make us holy, make us pure uh, for your glory. Help us to do ministry uh, and enable us, uh, empower us through your spirit and so that uh, we will be a blessing uh, to the people that you have sent us to. We thank you and this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I wish you well. Um, I continue saying that I don't know how long this uh, lesson will go and will keep uh, taking a day at a time, uh, taking a lesson at a time, and I'm sure uh, God uh, is enabling us to be edified. We thank uh, the, the Spirit of God for convicting us and drawing us closer uh, to Christ and even uh, helping us to learn more about Him. So I wish you well and Mungu awabariki sana.